This is February 26, 2008. My name is Margaret Lostro. I am doing an interview with Dick Karen, uh, who was a veteran of the World War II Marine Corps. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm doing this interview for the Cincinnati Public Library. Dick, do you want to tell us a little bit about your uh, background before the service and then how you got into the service and uh, anything you wanted to add uh, that you remember in the service and also your life afterwards? Okay. I'm not going to stop and uh, ask a question unless there's a specific question that I thought might lend to the interview. Okay, I was uh, born up in Mount Vernon, Ohio, up north, about 35, 40 miles north of Columbus in uh, 1924. Uh, was educated in the public schools there. I was an athlete and played uh, football, baseball, and basketball, and so forth. And uh, in 1941, when the Japanese hit Pearl Harbor, I was a senior in high school. And uh, that after at the, after that time, the the following uh, months, uh, I was quite interested in in following the war, course of the war, and I had two brothers in the service at that time. And uh, I uh, graduated from high school in 1942, and I had a chance to go out to uh, Southwest Missouri State College in Springfield, Missouri, and play football, which I was inter quite interested in doing, and also I was thinking about joining the Marine Corps. The war, of course, had been going on for about six months then. And uh, my mother said, no, you wait. And you have two older brothers in the, in the uh, service. And uh, so I went out to Southwest Missouri State and I played a year of varsity football. I, I came home at, uh, at Christmas time and told my mother, I said, if I wait, I'm going, I was 18 years old, I'm gonna be drafted. So, uh, I went up to Cleveland and joined the Marine Corps. And uh, a, 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 they had a spinal meningitis problem at uh, Paris Island at the Marine Corps boot camp at that time. So uh, they sent me out to California. And I went through boot camp in San Diego. And uh, of course, they always branded us as Hollywood Marines <laughs> being on the West Coast and so forth. Uh, then uh, in the Marine Corps, I went through about 12 weeks of boot camp and uh, they gave us a, a, our choice of what branch of the service we wanted in. At least you hoped you would get it. And uh, I t uh, uh, told them I wanted to, to be in the Marine Paratroopers first and the Marine Raiders second. Well, I got my choice. I was Marine, a Marine Paratrooper. And I went up to Camp Gillespie, California. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, I was uh, trained as a paratrooper, five weeks of... Uh, of uh, training in, in parachute school, learning uh, to jump, and the most physical and most demanding thing that I'd ever been into, even much tougher than the college football, and uh, great food, and we made uh, six jumps, and uh, they sent us down from there to uh, Camp Elliott for advanced training, and in four weeks we were on our way over to the South Pacific. Uh, we went to uh, to New Caledonia. We were aboard a ship, the USS Rochambeau, which had been a French luxury liner, at least they said it had been. Uh, it was, uh, most of the guys referred to it as a garbage cow. But uh, it was uh, a, a situation where we had uh, two meals a day and a cup of soup at noon. You filled your canteen uh, once a day. And we had 2,300 troops on that ship. And uh, it took us 24 days to get to Numia, New Caledonia. And there we went into training, uh, parachute uh, training, uh, jungle training. Do, do you remember any specific uh, incidences um, uh, that has stuck in your memory th through the years in New, Cal New Caledonia? In, in, uh, yes, in New Caledonia, uh, we were sent up about 60 miles from the capital city of Noumea 
uh, to train up there. And uh, we went, we had, it was really a, a tough training and so forth. And uh, we had uh, quite a number of, uh, of uh, troops w w within our, we had about 20, 24 or 2,500 troops there. And it was really too, uh, too dense to, to uh, uh, jump for in training around there. So we, uh, we had tough training. It was out in, the, in the, what they called the boondocks. And we were out there. Uh, we got off in three and four day problems. And uh, uh, one of the, the big problems, uh, of course, we had was, well, it wasn't that big a problem, I guess it was, but uh, was, the food wasn't that great. And uh, General Vandergrift, who was the, later the commandant of the Marine Corps, who was the commander of the Fleet Marine Force out there then, I remember going through line, the line one time, and uh, they had sweet potatoes. And one of the guys looked, they started to put some on his tray, and he said, no, I don't want any of that stuff. And he had some comment about it. And General Vandergrift walked over and said to the, uh, the chief cook, he says, isn't there any way you could display those a little better so that they'd be more appetizing? <laughs> and, uh, uh, but it was, it, was, uh, it was tough training. And uh, we, uh, we went from there up to Guadalcanal for a short time and, and uh, about a week of training there. And then we went to uh, a little island called Vela La Vela, which had been recently secured by uh, the New Zealand Army and some of the American troops. And uh, we went into, uh, we knew we were going into combat from there. Yeah. And uh, it was a, the island itself was a miserable place. Uh, the, the worst things I recall were the lizards and the uh, uh, things like that. that I got into your, we had slept a lot of it in, in, actually in hammocks. You had a slip trench below your hammock. And when the Jap Japanese still controlled the air at that time, and they'd come over to bomb, you'd unzip the zipper and roll out into your foxhole or slip trench. And, but the biggest problem you had, it was either uh, uh, land crabs or lizards in there, or if, if not that, half full of water. So, uh, but we, uh, we trained there for uh, uh, some time and went out on patrols and things like that. And again, it was a, a problem of food. And uh, uh, we, uh, we had rash short rations at noon. And uh, we, uh, uh, you know, the Marines are called the great scroungers. I don't know whether you've ever heard that or not, but it's true. And uh, we, uh, uh, so the 53rd Seabees were over there, and we went over around where they were. You know, we always, we always liked those guys, and, and they liked the Marines. And uh, we uh, started, got acquainted with them and so forth, and uh, said, why don't you guys come over and eat with us tonight? So three or four of us would. We'd go, then we started to work the camp. Every night we'd hit another group or so forth. So we didn't do too badly on the, <laughs> on the food deal. but. Uh, we uh, got the word then about the early in, uh, or late, late October, actually, that you're going to be going into combat. And the next month in November, we went into combat at Bougainville. Uh, you obviously went by boat over there. Pardon? Bougainville. You had to travel by uh, boat. Yeah, over yeah. There. Well, Bo Bougainville was right, uh, not too far from. Uh, uh, Vela Lavelle. You, you may have read or heard in the past about John Kennedy and the, at, at Colomangara and the, the, the problem yeah. there in the Navy and so forth. So the Japanese still had pretty good control of things around it. And, and one thing I remember at uh, night in, in, uh, on Vela Lavella, they would come over and they actually they were nuisance bombings. They would uh, send a couple of bombers over and they'd drop a few, maybe a couple hundred pound bombs and things, but just enough to for hurt, or you know, trying to hurt morale and, and, and things like that. And uh, uh, so we, uh, uh, we, we knew what to expect. And we got into Bougainville, and it was a, Bougainville was a, an island, I, I guess about 50 miles long. And so I don't know how wide, but it was a miserable place. And the jungle, heavy jungle, and uh, really intense jungle, and the, uh, the uh, 3rd Marine Division had gone in ahead of us. So they used us uh, uh, mainly for patrols 
when we first got there. And then one day they came down and said, uh, you're gonna, we're going to use you guys on a raid up into uh, enemy territory. They're shelling our hospital from up in there. So we went up about 13 miles into enemy territory. Uh, we had to go by a uh, rubber boat and so forth. And uh, we went up uh, about 13 miles and we uh, were to hit uh, uh, at 6 o'clock in the morning. Well, it was pouring down rain. It rained all that night and all day and so forth. And uh, we got up to that area and we were signaled in on a, a, uh, a yellow light. And we were supposed to go in on a green light. So, so somebody asked a question that, but they said, well, somebody probably made a mistake. And we went in and we got about uh, uh, four or 500 yards in and we ran into the most awful fire from the enemy that uh, they had in the South Pacific up at that time, I think. And we had a battalion of uh, paratroopers, which would have been about 450, and one company of raiders, about 140 or 450. And uh, we formed a perimeter from the ocean to try to, to uh, carry out the assault. And I was right at the point, and not by choice. I just happened to be, to fall in that particular situation with our company. And we got up and all this firing started, and I turned around to wave the rest of our guys up like this, and a sniper in a tree shot me in the back. And, and the bullet hit me so hard that it spun me around and knocked me in behind some uh, ammunition that was stacked all over. And that's the thing that saved my life. And uh, I, was, I was back in there, and I, and I, I was partially paralyzed. I couldn't move, could hardly move. And my squad leader, said, you stay there and I'll get you out. And eventually that somebody had shot the sniper in the tree and he, he uh, came up or he crawled up and he got me on his back and he crawled out. And I still say he's the best friend I ever had. Yeah, okay. he, he was given a silver star for that, but uh, he got me out and they got me down on the beach and they had us out on the beach and it was pouring down rain and they passed a word to slow down on the firing because we were running short on ammunition. And we were supposed to be up there for three days. And uh, they, the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the telephones had gone out. And they uh, tried to get word down to the beach and they said, well, there's no communication. And just about then a destroyer came up by on patrol and one of our guys who'd been run a weightlifting studio in, in uh, Oakland, California, swam out to that destroyer. And he got the Silver Star for that. And he got word to them. So they called other ships up and they laid down a barrage uh, pretty heavy. And they got us out. We lost, we lost quite a few men. We, 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 I don't know how many we had killed, but we lost a lot wounded. And they got us out. And uh, they took me on this destroyer I was on. They took me right down to, to um, uh, Vela La Vela, the field hospital down there and they performed surgery on me. Mm -hmm. And from there I went down to the hospital in Guadalcanal and uh, I was in Guadalcanal for some time and, and that was during Christmas of uh, 43. And then uh, they sent me down to a, a big hospital in New Caledonia, Naval Hospital. And one day an, an officer came in he said, well, I got good news and bad news. Which do you want first? So we said, give us the good news. He said, you're going home. And somebody said, you mean we're going back to the States? He said, yep, you're going home. Oh, wow. What's the bad news? They've disbanded your parachute organization. You're going to form an infantry outfit in California and you're losing your $50 a month junk pay. Oh. So, so that was pretty much the story then. I bet you remember the name of the officer that... Uh... Got me out. Absolutely. Lonnie Stokes, Sergeant Lonnie Stokes from, from Asheville, North Carolina. And, this, and the sad part in, uh, uh, to me, uh, he, got, he didn't go, when, when we formed the 5th Division, he had, uh, I don't know whether he had asked for a transfer or what, but I did run into him once at Camp Pendleton. And uh, as, I never did see him after that, and I, I could never locate him. So I don't know what, whether he'd been killed in the com, uh, combat later on or, or what, but he was a great guy, I'll tell you. Yeah, I imagine you, you 
you tried to stay in touch with him and yes and I tried to locate him and uh, but I, I was unable to do it and I guess if I'd probably worked harder at it I probably could have but uh, uh, you know after the war things kind of you kind of drifted apart mm -hmm. and uh, yes now after your recuperation time um, did you go back to the Marines or yeah, yeah. I was as a matter of fact uh, the doctors down there in the islands told me said well I still got the bullet in the chest it's oh, scattered in parts and so forth and when I go down to for an x-ray or anything they call always call me back and say you know I'm gonna check you out there's something wrong with you. but uh, uh, the doctor told me that uh, down there he said well your combat days are over well when I went back I came home for 30 days uh, to Mount Vernon and uh, I seemed to have bad luck following me I guess I, I had to get all new uh, uh, clothing and shoes and so forth and I got home and had a blister on my heel and it, it's, it got to where it was really sore in my leg and I saw it had red streaks going up my leg and my mother took me to a doctor and he said you got blood poison so they put me on medications and I spent eight or ten days of my leave at home with my leg elevated on a chair and so forth but uh, I did get a uh, 30 day leave I had uh, uh, 23 days at home I think so it took about four days to travel to what you couldn't fly you couldn't get any flights then it was all by train and mm -hmm. a day coach and so forth but uh, I went back to, to uh, Camp Pendleton checked in and I thought I was going to be limited duty and I went over they said uh, you're assigned to 27th Marines and I said 27th Marines they said uh, yeah you're in a uh, anti-tank outfit so I went over and it was a 37 field piece the anti-tank guns all down in the mud pulling yeah. out all that stuff so I said uh, I want to transfer the guy said you don't like us? And I said, no, I'm not, I don't have anything against you guys, but I, I don't like this outfit. I want out of it. And so the next day I was back in the infantry again, 27th Marines. And uh, uh, when I went over to report to 27th Marines, the captain <coughs> was a huge man, <coughs> excuse me. And uh, when I saw his name on his jacket, it was uh, Captain Ben Soane. And I looked at him and I said, uh, are you Ben Soon, the All-American football player at Southern California? He said, that's me, and so, <laughs> so forth. And that really impressed me. So uh, I didn't feel too badly about uh, being in the, being in the uh, back in the infantry. But uh, uh, then we trained and, uh, at Camp Pendleton. And uh, from the uh, train at Camp Pendleton, we went to, to Hawaii. And we trained in Hawaii for quite some time up in the mountains and so forth. And one, one incident. Uh, at California, I might mention, uh, out around San Clemente Island, I think that's where uh, President Nixon was from, wasn't he? We held maneuvers out there. <clears throat> and we were on four day maneuvers, and boy, it, they were miserable, and, and uh, uh, it was tough. And we were down to, the, we gathered down on the beach after it was over, and uh, one, a, a colonel came up, and he said, All you guys get around here, I want to talk to you. And he said, President Roosevelt sends his congratulations on this field problem you guys have held. And somebody said, President Roosevelt, and he pointed and he said, up there. And we looked up and here was a big limousine. And uh, President Roosevelt and Admiral King, Fleet Commander of the Pacific, General Van Grift, now Commandant of the Marine Corps, and uh, one of the other high naval officers, and, and uh, Roosevelt's son, Jimmy Roosevelt, who was a colonel in the Marine Corps, they were all up there watching. And somebody <clears throat> said, uh, said, Colonel, what's that mean? He said, they got something special for us. <laughs> we found out it was Iwo Jima. Oh. So uh, that's, uh, we, we, uh, we had gone to uh, uh, Hawaii and we trained in Hawaii for quite some time. Well, I guess probably five months, something like that. And uh, you know, you always hear about Hawaii being the beautiful tropical paradise. Well, we were right between Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa, two huge volcanoes, about 13, 14,000 feet up. <clears throat> and uh, we, the camp uh, was right between some areas that was all rocks and sand and so forth. 
And one guy said this, and I've never forgotten it. He said, you know, this is the only place where you can stand in mud up to your butt and have dust blow in your eyes. <laughs> and I think that was pretty, pretty true. Uh, as a matter of fact, a tent didn't last too long. We had six-man tents, and they didn't last too long. That wind just tore them apart. But uh, it was an ideal place for training, but we didn't realize it at the time. And, and the thing that was interesting about it, right, it was, in fact, it was on the King Ranch over there, which was 57,000 acre ranch, the second biggest in the world, I think. And uh, we, uh, uh, we trained in all that area, and, and it, was, it was all cactus and mud and, and sand and, and various other things. And uh, the showers we took were from right off of Mauna Kea, the cold water that had, didn't have any hot water or anything like that. But uh, we trained there for some time. Right about Christmas time, 1944, 43, uh, they passed a word. They said, we're going to be leaving soon. And uh, they had a big turkey dinner for us for Christmas and all this stuff, you know. And it said, well, we're, we're, going to, we're going to be taken off in January. So we did. And we uh, found out when we got aboard ship, we went over to, to the big, or we went over to uh, uh, to uh, Oahu, uh, and uh, we were over at Nimitz Field there, and had all we played football, baseball, basketball, whatever you wanted to play. We were going to be there about three or four days, and then we got aboard ship. And when we got about 20 miles out, our colonel told us, he says, "You're going to Iwo Jima." Well, nobody had ever heard of Iwo Jima before, and they started asking, "Where was that?" Well. It's going to be a five, three to five day operation. Now, that was significant. Three to five days you're going to take that, and then you're going to go over to Chichijima. And I don't know whether you've ever heard of that, but that's where President Bush, the, the first Bush, that's where he bailed out out there and they picked him up out of the sea. And uh, <clears throat> we were to take that. So uh, we held maneuvers in Saipan and Tinian. And, uh, uh, we, we were aboard an LST, and I, are you familiar with yes. those? And we had uh, most of our company on that, and uh, uh, I was fortunate there. I ran into a kid from, it was pretty close to my hometown. He was in the Navy, and he was serving on, on the uh, uh, LST 929, and uh, uh, we, we got to be pretty good. For, oh, I hadn't known him before, but he, he knew me, but I guess from having played football yes. and so forth. <clears throat> and uh, he said, uh, I'll take care of you on the, on the chow bit. Well, that was important <laughs> because the chow on the LST wasn't too good. So he took real good care of me there. And, uh, but we, uh, we made some landings on Saipan and Tinian, and, and uh, uh, we knew we were soon going to be going into combat now. Iwo Jima, they told us, they said, you're going to take this in three to five days. And they, they all, uh, they went through all this stuff about, you know, the, the terrain and so on. Well, I, Iwo Jima is an unbelievable place. It was five, uh, seven and a half square miles. All uh, rock and, 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 and uh, arroyos, canyons, uh, uh, caves and so forth. And uh, we found that later, but uh, we, we couldn't believe the armada of ships that we saw that morning when we saw we were near Iwo Jima. Six battleships, carriers, I don't know how many carriers, but uh, we, we were to go in in amphibian tractors, and then they had all the amphibian tractors down in the hold. And, uh, they, before, we went, uh, before we went aboard those uh, amphibian tractors, we uh, went up in, in line and they, they smeared a, a, a white salve all over our face, hands, and they exposed part of the skin. And uh, one of the guys said, what's that for? And he said, well, when you go by the ship out, the, destro uh, the battleship out here, uh, the USS Tennessee, when they fire those big guns, that flash is really uh, 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 real serious burns, mm -hmm. and this will protect you. Then the other thing, they said, open up your jacket. And we opened up our jacket, and they sprayed us with DDT. Well, now that's unlawful now, isn't it, in, the, <laughs> in this country? 
and they sprayed us with DDT because they, they had a, a thing called scrub typhus on it, on the island. And they said this would get into the pores and then eventually into the lungs and it could be fatal. So they sprayed us with that and, and we, uh, uh, then we had the, uh, the uh, white salve on and, and they put us in, 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 uh, in formation to get, go down into the amphibian tractors. And the thing I've always, and I never could understand this, I looked over and I saw a lot of white crosses lined up along the wall or bulkhead as they call it of the, of the ship. I thought they could have done a little better job covering those up or something. But, uh, but uh, uh, that's when, then we landed on February 19th and that morning. Mm -hmm. Okay, you want me to go on with the whatever? <laughs> okay. Uh, we were in the second wave of what they called uh, 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 down near Suribachi. Now, I said the island was seven and a half uh, square miles, and I remember this so vividly. I as I was on Iwo Jima 21 days, and I never saw a building on that island. It was almost incredible. And when we landed uh, on that morning, we lost 26% of our company on that beach. Now, we had 20 or 250 men in our company, and we lost 26% of them on the beach. That's incredible. But we had never expected anything like what we got. That the, they had had the, the uh, frogmen go up there before, a week or two before, and they checked things out along the, the coastal areas. And, but they, they did, they, they produced a film not long ago called uh, Flags of Our Fathers. Did you see that? Uh, and the other one was called uh, Letters from Iwo Jima. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it, it sh what that showed was pretty much the way it was. And they had, the beaches were terraced like this, where you had, to, you had to climb those, and you'd sink in up to your knees. And we were, then they led us, the first two waves in, I was in the second wave, and the waves were four and a half minutes apart. And they would let, uh, they, they, they let the first three waves in, and then they opened up with everything. And we were caught down on the beach, and so that's why we had so many casualties. Yeah. And, uh, Oh, uh, 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 we, uh, uh, they, had, they were in caves. Now, they had caves that would accommodate anywhere up to 25 or 30 to 400 or 500 men. And the thing we didn't know, they had entrances on either side of them. And we'd be trying, we'd be assaulting the entrance on this side, and they'd be going out the other side and coming back around shooting at us from behind. So, uh, uh, but we had, uh, at Mount Suribachi, it took four days to take that, and that's when they put the flag up, and that was a great time. Everybody, you know, actually, they, th they thought they may have to, to pull us out because of so many casualties. Uh, uh, oh, I can't remember the, the man's name. It had the San Francisco Examiner, uh, uh, well, whatever. He was one, uh, he pro really protested, and Robert McCormick, who, uh, who uh, owned the uh, Chicago Tribune? He did. They get these men out of here. There's, it's a slaughter and so forth. And uh, when we finally took, uh, got that flag up there, we said we're here to stay. And uh, it was an incredible uh, situation. And uh, we moved across the island. One of our guys that was pretty well known before that, John Bazalone who was a Congressional Medal of Honor winner at, uh, at uh, Guadalcanal, uh, was killed instantly on the beach, and that was one of the things, you know, Bazalone's dead. He had a machine gun section in our battalion. Mm -hmm. And uh, we moved across the island, and the, the thing that was so uh, uh, fearsome about it was the Japanese artillery. It was just like boom and bam, and right after that, you know, they hit in front of you, and we lost Two of our, uh, our officers killed right on the beach, and then we had two more of them wounded the first day. And we actually had a sergeant handling one of our uh, companies there for a short time until they got a replacement. And uh, the uh, Japanese, were, of course, they uh, they had to, they went after Mount Suribachi uh, to uh, to knock that out, and then. Uh, 
they told us we would move north and uh, we had to try to get them out of those caves and places like that that they were in now. We had 70,000 Marines involved in that campaign and they had 20, 22,000. And I've, I don't know whether I've had the figures or not, uh, but we had uh, in 31 days, uh, we were expected to take Iwo in five days. The 27th Marines had less than 500 men out of 3,000 left from our, from our regiment. And, uh, and I might add that uh, of the medics, we lost 20, uh, 23 doctors and 800 and some corpsmen. That was uh, at the, the, the total, you know, but, but uh, the things that happened that, uh, and I, I think people find this sometimes even maybe hard to believe, but those Japanese would, at night, they would f infiltrate and they would, we put our dead out on stretchers and covered them with ponchos to take them later down to the, the cemetery for burial. And those Japanese would come infiltrate at night and they would roll the body off the stretcher and get under that poncho and they'd have a carbine and we'd be moving troops around or moving them up and we'd have one of them suddenly fell over shot right through the head and killed instantly and we couldn't find them. And they brought the war dogs in and the Doberman pincers and, uh, and uh, German shepherds. And they, uh, the other problem we had, they'd take oil drums and cut the ends out of them, put them in the ground, get inside, well camouflaged with a, uh, with a carbine, a short uh, barrel weapon, and they'd start killing the Marines like that. So they, it was unbelievable, some of, the, some of the methods they had. But it was a fantastic job that was done by that General Kiribayashi uh, in defending that island. It was incredible what they had done to, to uh, uh, you could go from one end of the island to the other underground and it was all lighted. It was, uh, uh, they had operating rooms underground, they had uh, uh, places to eat underground, they had all kind of ammunition stored underground. So they'd been pre preparing for this for a long, long time. And uh, it, was, it was just an incredible op uh, operation. Uh, some of the other things that, uh, well, the ramparts were about 30 feet high that we had to go up. And uh, our I mentioned our losses on the beach. And uh, we, uh, uh, well, let's see. Those, I mentioned what those uh, caves could accommodate. And uh, uh, they also had their operating rooms right there. As a matter of fact, one of our guys said, about 10 years ago, he'd gone back to Iwo Jima, and he said they had found an operating room, they uncovered it, and it was still a skeleton on the operating table there, where they died in there. And there's still some of our, they could never recover, that uh, they couldn't find them. Um, let's see. Uh, we had our rations, we had K rations and C rations, and uh, we carried, they gave us enough, they said, we're giving you guys enough for three days because this operation is going to take three to five days. And you have enough rations here, it gives K rations and D ration bars and things like that. And uh, it took, really it was 36 days before it was finally announced secured. But, uh, uh, and this I think is, is rather interesting. That island was a, was a uh, sulfur island and it was hot and you could, and we did this, we could take a, a K-bar knife and make a hole in the ground and stick a sea ration can in there, punch a hole in it, and in a short time it was so hot you could hardly eat it. Now the, the big problem we had was with fo foxholes or slit trenches. You dig those and you'd get in, you could only stay in there so long because it was so hot. And the big problem was when the Japanese started shelling and they'd, uh, they would, uh, 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 Hit, hit the areas there like that, and you had to get out, and stay on top of the ground, and then get back in, get, flip flop in and out to try to 
try to, uh, and, the, and the biggest problem we had was in, when the, the Air Force would come in to strafe and they'd come down to there, we'd lay our marking panel. You had to stay in that hole. So we actually had some casualties from uh, uh, burns, that some that we lost. Um, you, have any, you have any questions? Yes. Uh, uh, but, uh, well, well I, I've got a few more. I mean, yeah, I, go uh, ahead. You go ahead and then. Uh, the Navy kept the island well lit at night with flares. They, they did a fantastic job. The naval casualties there were, were serious. They lost uh, uh, two carriers, and the Saratoga was badly injured, uh, badly damaged, and they lost 100, had 191 men killed on the Saratoga. Uh, but uh, we sat up on, the, on a high elevation one night and watched those kamikaze planes hit uh, the uh, Bellow Wood was one of them, and they sunk it there. And uh, then they hit our, our uh, uh, ammunition dump, and that, that was unbelievable. It was like a Fourth of July all over Cincinnati when they hit that. And, and uh, uh, they, uh, oh, let's see, I mentioned, with the flag raising on the fourth day, suddenly there was a huge cheer went up, and everybody couldn't believe it, but there's an American flag flying on Sarabachi. And cheer, it was like a football game. People just cheer, guys just cheering and yelling and everything. You know, we're here to stay, we're here to stay. And uh, uh, I gave Dennis a picture of the flag that uh, he has. It, uh, uh, all the kamikazes were lost in those things. You know, it's like somebody said, there wasn't a living uh, kamikaze pilot after the war. Yeah. But uh, uh, we, the flamethrowers, war dogs, Anything to try to, to, to get that thing over. And, and I think this might be interesting. Uh, when they had the, the, the film out at uh, Wyoming on uh, uh, Ken Burns' uh, war, a lady was there and she was talking with me. We were walked out and we were talking and she said she had been a Navy nurse. And I said, uh, were you, uh, were you uh, uh, in World War II? And she said, yes. And I said, well, uh, where were you? And she said, well, I was in the uh, Naval Hospital on Guam. And I said, well, I was there in, in, on Guam in the uh, Iowa Heights Naval Hospital. And she said, well, that's where I was. And we went on talking. And she, her husband was an a, a Army pilot. And he was one of the 26 pilots that the Japanese, when they pulled the last bonsai at the north end of the island, killed all of them. Yeah. And her husband was one that was killed. And uh, I, I had her name, and I somewhere I lost it. And she, but she lives in Wyoming, I think. At the, oh, really? Mm -hmm. uh, we our our losses. We had six thousand eight hundred and fifty-five dead and twenty-two thousand wounded, and all the Japanese except uh, six or seven hundred uh, were killed, mm -hmm. and uh, the rest of, we had those as, as prisoners now. Uh, the, uh, uh, I mentioned the kamikaze planes, and the, we had flamethrowing tanks that we used and uh, so forth to try to burn those places out, and, and it really, it was an incredible thing. It was, uh, you know, when you, when you think about it, when we go to reunions, the guys talk about it, it's, uh, now it's different, and, you know, it's, they kind of joke about some of these things, and I was, uh, uh, interested in, uh, in some of the comments some of the other guys had to make about, you know, and uh, one of them who was in a, a wheelchair in Chicago in the hotel there, and I heard a guy going, <laughs> and I looked over, and he's in this wheelchair, and he says, and this Jap came up over there, and he says, I opened up one, and he was paraplegic at the, was there at the reunion. At, so uh, we get, we get pretty good turnout yet for, and we're talking about people almost in their 90s. Now, I'm, I'm going to be 84 in a couple of weeks. And, and I, was, I, was, I had my 21st birthday on Iwo Jima. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we got some guys at those, those reunions that are almost 90. That, uh, and you know, you see them come in now, and I told Jenny when my wife, when we were at, at the reunion at Ra in Raleigh, North Carolina in August, I said, that's Joe, so we knew him. And I, I said, can you imagine him charging the beach on Iwo Jima? So, uh, <laughs> Um, well, that's, uh, 
uh, we, we were moving up the island and uh, I had a, a, a young kid that came into my squad. He was from Baltimore and he was a, he was a character. And uh, uh, one night we, they were, we were told the Japanese are going to try to infiltrate. They can't, get, they have to have water. They, there was no place to get water on the island except for basins that they caught water from the rain and so forth. And uh, they said, so they came and told us, my squad and some of the other guys said, tie your weapons in here. They're going to be coming up through this area. We're, we're sure. I apparently had captured one of them. And, that, and so this kid, we slept in two in a foxhole. And one would sleep and the other would watch in two hours. And, you know. So he said, do you want to go first or uh, you want me to go first? I said, oh, you can go first. And uh, so he did. He slept. I woke him up two hours later and I, I went to sleep and I woke up. I don't know what happened and I woke up and this kid sound asleep over the end of the, end of that hole. We both had been asleep. And I gave him the word and then it was a half an hour later that they did infiltrate. They had about 12 or 14 of them that came in there. and. Uh, uh, I, uh, well, he, he got through it with me, and on, when the day I got shot was on the 21st day, and we were coming up toward the end of the island, and the assault, it was really something else, a, the fierce battle, and he got shot right through the rear end, and he, he was only 17 years old now, and he started screaming and yelling, and I told him, I said, you keep your mouth shut, he said, I, I, I'll get you down in the shell crater. To fix you up. And then we didn't have penicillin. We had uh, uh, sulfur powder. And uh, I pulled his pants down, dusted him with sulfur powder and so on, and tried to keep, keep him quiet. And I carried a BAR, that uh, automatic weapon, and I had it set up to, to, in our area. And uh, uh, I told him, I said, now, you think you can be moved? I can move you? And he said, yeah. I said, okay. So I got him on my back and I crawled up over the edge of the, of the shell crater we were in. And I crawled down about probably 35 or 40 yards, and there was a, a, a medic down there, a corpsman, and he took him. He said, I'll take him. So then I, I, I said, I, I'm going back to my position, but he's okay with you. And he said, yeah, sure, I'll take him. So I ran, I was, I was on a run, going back and running low, and so and all of a sudden I got hit right here in the shoulder, and that's a picture that we had. It came out my back and that thing, I remember spinning around in the air and so forth after I got hit. And I knew I'd been hit, and I didn't know how badly, but I could feel the blood running down my back and so forth. So I waited a little bit and I, I finally got crawled over the edge and, and crawled down there and, and the, uh, the uh, corpsman came over and he got me, he said, we'll, we'll take you. And they put me on a Jeep and took me down to the aid station on the beach. And they were working on me and some uh, uh, Marine had a camera and he said, look over here, I'm going to put you in the movies. And I just happened to look up then and he took that picture. And it's been in the, the, to the uh, different things. That, remember the one series they had, the, I forget what, a naval series about some years ago it was on and I forget some of them, but it's been in all those. So I have a picture over here of it. That, uh, they flew me down to Guam, and uh, I was uh, in the hospital at Guam. They operated on me, and then about three days later, put me on a plane, sent me back to Hawaii to the hospital, Naval Hospital, or to, uh, well, Naval Hospital was filled, so they sent me over to Army Hospital, Schofield Barracks, and there we went to, uh, uh, later we went to, uh, after I got out of the hospital, went to a, a, a transit center, and back to my outfit and got ready to go to Japan for the invasion of Japan when they dropped the atom bomb. So, but I did go to Japan. I spent three weeks in occupation duty in Japan. This is one thing that's amazed me. I've done a few more Marines that have followed the same path as you. But how many of that you guys were sent over to Japan more or less as occupational right. after the bomb? I thought, it seems like they would get you on the fastest plane home. <laughs> well, they, they had, 
uh, we were we were tr training for the invasion of Japan. Yes. And we'd, we'd they'd build little shacks and we'd tear them down or use flamethrowers or something, you know, and we were out training. It was intense training. And uh, one day, a, 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 a staff sergeant came out and he had a list. And he said, okay, I'm gonna call these names. And any of you guys on here that I call that have two purple hearts, you're going home. Boy, a big cheer, you know, and so forth. So they called these names. He says, okay, that's it. I said, hey, you, Sergeant, you didn't call my name. He says, what's your name? I said, Karen, J.R. He said, he went down and listened. You're not on there. I said, I should be. I got two Purple Hearts. He said, oh, were you one of those guys, one of those paratroopers that came in here in the, in the yeah. fifth? And I said, yeah. He said, you went home after the first one. You're going to hit Japan with us. Oh. <laughs> of course, that was typical of Marine Corps. They, you know, they didn't handle you with kid gloves. <laughs> But uh, that was, uh, that was, uh, uh, no, I was in, in Japan only about three, about three weeks, uh, and I came back on the point system uh -huh. that they had. I had a lot of points built up, and uh, I came back, and uh, they sent me down to Marine Base and gave me all new clothes and everything, sent me to, to uh, Great Lakes, Illinois, and three days later I was discharged. I'm sure to the relief of your family. Pardon? I'm sure to the relief of your family. Oh yeah, they, they were they were glad to see me when I got back. I, but uh, I uh, uh, I was still in pretty good shape. I that <laughs> you know didn't so I I, I told I told my mother I said well, I'm going back to Missouri. I'm going back and play. Philly. I got three more years of football eligibility <laughs> left. So I uh, I went back to Southwest Missouri State and and I played uh, three years of varsity football and. Uh, so on, and uh, they graduated in 1950. It's quite an amazing story. But you know, one thing that I noticed in this is uh, when they wait, make these modern war movies, and even the ones mm -hmm. that they made more with more propaganda in them earlier, um, you don't know quite what to believe and what not to. And I think you're generation that experiences has been able to, just like when you talked about Mount Sarabachi and the flag and mm -hmm. everything, I've heard people say, oh, that wasn't that, you know, but you that were there are able to tell how it is. I think it's marvelous. Well, you know, that uh, you, that's a good point you brought up there because I speak at high schools. I go to a number of high schools yeah. and speak to the history classes and so forth. And I could say, oh, was it really that tough? Or, you know, so I've heard about this, or I've heard about that. And uh, the kids would say, uh, did you ever kill a Jap? And if you tell them yes, hey, now wait a minute. You know, I said, do you realize they were trying to kill us? I said, that was a war going on. I said, you, you guys, uh, you, you know, I don't know whether you're with this or not, that uh, yeah. uh, this was a war. and. Uh, uh, some of the things that, that happened, uh, like you're talking about some, you know, some of the, the propaganda and, and so forth, but uh, uh, the, the, you know, the, the guys that were in combat really have some stories to tell. And, and I, I enjoy talking to these guys that, that were over in Europe at the, in the Battle of the Bulge and, and places like that, you know, and my, my oldest brother, he was in the invasion of North Africa. He run a Higgins boat. To, there and, and we used to talk about some of that and but uh, uh, a lot of times people say I don't want to hear that stuff you know you guys uh, uh, talk about uh, this uh, and you know some of them question about how much of it is true there are so many things that happen that are almost unbelievable that that happened that uh, uh, I uh, there was a, a, a gentleman out in uh, uh, Arizona. I, I think Flagstaff, some, someplace around there, that's written a book now. It's called Iwo Jima, Assault on Hell. So he sent me a copy of it, and it was a huge book. It was about 780 pages, double, double spaced, but it was about so big. And he asked me, he said, w would you check, read through this, and if, if there's any uh, corrections or anything that you could see, uh, uh, let me know. And uh, so I did, and then he had me send it on to a Marine officer that was up in Hanover, New Hampshire. And I had a, a letter from him recently that uh, he said, well, I'm, he said, I, I'm trying to get the Naval uh, 
Pre Naval Institute Press to, uh, to do this book. He said, I've done two others. And he said, uh, if, uh, if they do, uh, I want you to, to be in Cincinnati. When I'm in Cincinnati, I want you to be with me when we uh, appear at one of the bookstores or something like that. And I told him, yeah, I'd be glad to. Yeah. But uh, uh, he, he had some things in there. And so I know people are going to read some of that and say, ah, oh, this good, this, you know. Yeah. But it did happen. It did. Yeah. And, and uh, it, was, uh, it was some of the things that, the, that I saw there that uh, uh, I saw one incident. And, and, you know, people say, well, why do you like to talk? I don't particularly enjoy talking about it. But the people ask, we were moving up, on, uh, uh, going across the plane, the, the plane they had there, the Japanese had terraced this all the way up, about 30 feet up in terraces, and then uh, the plane was right across where they hoped to get everybody out in there when they shelled us. And uh, I was, I had dug a foxhole, and I was down that foxhole looking up, and a plane, an uh, uh, American uh, naval plane came over. And this, this guy, I could see him. It was, he, he probably wasn't over 150 feet up in the air. And I could see him. And he, he came around like this, circled around, and came back to make his run. And all of a sudden, I saw him go over like this. Well, in a, in a, a, a fighter plane, they've got a, 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 on the stick they control it by, they've got a, a red button on that stick that controls the machine guns. And he apparently fell forward, and his head was on that button on that oh. machine gun, and it came right around like this, right over me, and right down, like right into the sea, and right over a whole amphibian tractor of guys coming in. So I don't know how many of those might have been, but he went in to see. That's the last I saw the plane, and I had some guy who said, "You know, did that really happen?" I said, "Get uh, Richard, uh, I forget his last name now. A book, Iwo Jima. He describes it in there." And uh, uh, that, that's, uh, you know, that, that's a, I, I know sometimes people probably doubt some of the things that happened. At, uh, I hear these guys tell about the Battle of Bulge, some of the things that happened, that you, you know, with the German tanks and all that stuff. That, uh, and I never questioned it. Yeah. Uh, you have answered a question of mine about some of the uh, Marines that went from the 3rd to the 5th Division. I did, never could figure out from anything I read why you told that mm -hmm. you answered that tonight yeah they uh they they decided that, and, and they were right they decided we couldn't jump down there the the, the jungle was too dense and mm -hmm. so forth and uh, uh they and we when we came back the marine raiders the same thing they they, they yeah. pulled the marine raiders out of they would land sometimes even from submarines and and make an island they landed and took make an island they came in from submarines Jimmy Roosevelt, incidentally, was a commanding officer of one of the uh, 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 one of the companies. But uh, uh, they, uh, uh, you know, they just a, a ma magnificent job of, of some of those with some of those things. But they they disbanded the paratroopers and the raiders, and they put us all into the Fifth Marine Division, yeah. and that made up almost half of that division, right. which all combat experience uh, men and so forth. Thank goodness. Well, okay. Um, what about uh, you? You said that you went back to college mm -hmm. in after you got discharged. Um, were you married at that time? No, okay. no. I I was uh, 22 when I went back to to college, and uh, I majored in history and government, and uh, played three years of varsity football. And uh, I got married, it was after my senior year. Uh, my wife is from Missouri. She was a cheerleader at, uh, at uh, uh, Southwest Missouri. And uh, I got married then, and then I coached in a small Catholic school in Springfield, Missouri for one year. And incidentally, this might have something to do with the, uh, one day my my track team, I coached football and track, my track team was over working out at the big public high sta uh, stadium in, in uh, Springfield. And uh, uh, I saw a guy and I thought, boy, I know this guy from someplace. 
And uh, I went over and I said, uh, uh, you know, weren't you in the Marine paratroopers? And he said, yeah. And he said, I, I said, but on the rugby team there, yeah. And so he said, you look familiar. And I told him, I said, I was in B Company and so forth. And he said, I said, is your name Morton? He said, yeah, Doug Morton. <laughs> and he was a captain. He was in, in, in uh, charge of the, of the uh, 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 Marine Active Reserve Unit in Springfield, Missouri. And he said, uh, Dick, I got a little thing that might interest you. And I said, what's that? And he said, I've got a, 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 a platoon o a job open over, uh, over at our uh, armory. And he said, I need a second lieutenant. And he said, you've graduated now and so forth. He said, uh, how about me uh, working you in there? He said, I can get you a commission. And my, uh, Rick, my oldest son, who was a colonel in the army now at West Point, he, Rick was then just three weeks old. And I said, Doug, I said, my, my wife would kill me if I could. <laughs> he said, well, you can pick up some money, you know. So he said, I said, what are you, what are you guys going to do if a war is there isn't going to be any war. Now, this was, in, oh. this was in May of 1950. He said, there isn't going to be any war. What are you talking about? And I said, well, I don't know. I said, boy, my wife would never go for it. And uh, he said, well, think it over. Well, they, they uh, 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 some of the guys at the college would, would join that to make money. You know, they go to camp yes. in the summer. And we had four of those guys that were killed up near the Chosin Reservoir in Korea. And he, but he made it too. He, I saw uh, in one of the Marine periodicals where he died about three or four years ago. Is but, that right? uh, yeah, but he was, he was back in Korea. So he'd been at Guadalcanal, Bougainville, Iwo Jima, and then later went back into Korea. So I think what you people are doing though is, is marvelous. I really do. I, I, uh, when I talk to those uh, uh, kids at the schools, I tell them, you know, I say, anytime you can find out any more information, I said, see the public libraries. They said, they've yeah. got good programs. That, you know, if we're going to get, they can come out and speak at our <laughs> retirees in Springfield. Yeah. So. Okay, well, I can, I don't understand why the students wouldn't just Believe every word you have to say. You did, you did a wonderful job. Well, uh, and you were you were a teacher, so you were used to dealing with them. That, I'm sure that helps. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, these kids are misled today too. A lot of them. You know, they they. Uh, I have kids. First thing you do when they come into class, put their head down, go to sleep. They, they tell them, you know, here, he's going to be <laughs> speaking here about World War Two. They put their head down at the desk and go to sleep. One teacher in one of the schools walked over to one kid and he tapped him on the back like that. And said, the kid walked over and put his chin up against the library, <laughs> against the, I mean, against the chalkboard and stood there for the, the rest of the period, which I thought was pretty good. Yeah. But uh, it's, uh, we, we uh, they do something up at Fairfield Middle School. It, the lady that's a, a, the um, health teacher up there, her, her father and I were on Iwo Jima together. We were, in fact, we were in the same platoon. Uh -huh. And uh, she's, uh, she decorates that building, the, the halls and everything, with all the memorabilia of World War II, uh -huh. uniforms, all the services and everything. Does a magnificent job. And then she, had, she called me some years ago and said, do you think you could get your American Legion uh, outfit to come up and uh, and uh, uh, put the flag up and so forth. I said we'll bring the we'll bring the, the shooters up, uh, everything. We'll twenty one gun salute and so forth. And I said whatever else you want. So we go up and they take that whole student body, fifteen hundred kids, yeah. take them out and put them out in front, in the parking lot and so forth. And we run the flag up and all this. And that. They have their band plays the national anthem. She does a marvelous job of, of that with those kids. And uh, other schools, you can't get them to do it. So I'd they, like to talk to you about that yeah. later too. Yeah, some of them, they'll just say, no, we're not, you know, we're not interested. So, but that's. Uh, you have been to the uh, 
Well, what was Beechwood's elementary school mm -hmm. to there? Yeah. I assume you're in that. Well, yeah. In fact, I tried to get a lot of our guys from the Legion pictures and so forth over there uh, for, for them, and they've done a marvelous job with that. The only thing I'm concerned about now is what's going to happen to it since they've gone down to where the kids are only first and second grade there. It, it worked pretty well with the kids that were in, you know, up to junior high age. But. Do you want to let people know what that's all about? Yeah. Go ahead. Pardon? Go ahead and tell them what that display is and how that oh, came about. Oh, it, uh, they, they have a display of, uh, uh, actually, a, a military display is marvelous. And, and uh, uh, they've done a, a super job with the pictures and, and all the history of people, local, local individuals, or people who are around the, from the area. And uh, uh, they not only that, but they've even got part of them from some of the athletes and and entertainers and so forth is a, another section of it. But uh, uh, there's some, well, they've even got a, a picture from General Schwarzkopf and uh, autographs on them and, uh, and Colin Powell and people like that. So we're among pretty good company over there, yeah. Peg. <laughs> that's, uh, and they, they do a nice job with that each oh, year. Yeah. Do, you, do you go over each, each year when they have it? To, I, I get there as often yeah. as I can. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, they, they have, well, uh, uh, Ted comes over and he's an MC there. To, so yeah. was that, that? So, but but uh, I hope they keep it. I, yeah. I hope it lasts because I think that was. Oh, I think we have I, to. I did it when I was publicity officer for the Legion uh, uh, Post there in Green Hills. I wrote quite an uh, 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 article on it for the National American Legion National Magazine, but we didn't get anything. I guess they just didn't figure that was the Legion had enough to do with it. That, but uh, I was hoping we'd get something in the Legion magazine about it. But he's, uh, Glenn's done a fantastic job with that. Phenomenal. Well, have you, time is right? Yeah. Okay. okay. It's a marvelous interview. And well, thank you. If it certainly doesn't tell the whole story, I don't know what it will. Well, I, and I want didn't you. want to dominate it like, <laughs> like I did, but I, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, that's the story. That's right, and you the, were honest, the, that's for sure. Yeah.